Welcome back, Inebriites. This is Andy, the Inebriar Podcast. I'm once again reaching a, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it seems like we're getting a lot of people from the UK lately. Uh, and I reached out to this person because I stum- stumbled across him on Twitter and uh, was really interested in what they do. Uh, Raymond Besant? Besant? Trying, man. Besant. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you are a wildlife photographer and a cameraman for the BBC. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, mostly my work is, uh, yeah, wildlife, wildlife documentaries for mm-hmm. TV, for BBC, uh, all sorts of independent production companies that uh, make work for Netflix and uh, Apple TV, Nat Geo, things like that. But um, I started off as a photographer and then kind of, uh, kind of changed tack kind of halfway through my career. So I, I still do photography, but uh, yeah, filming is mostly uh, what I do now. And I was pretty psyched because I, I do enjoy documentaries and it's usually like um, nature or science or history related. So I was kind of like really excited. BBC makes great shows. And so everyone yeah. I'm like, I was kind of bragging. I'm like, I get to talk to a BBC cameraman. They're like, does he know? Um, <laughs> oh God. Why am I blanking on his name? Um, David Attenborough. They're like, does he know David Attenborough? I'm like, I, I don't know. Uh, do you get asked that a lot being working for the BBC in a wildlife type of thing um yeah i guess he's the kind of obvious kind of figurehead and uh i mean i am like everybody else i know it's a complete cliche but i grew up kind of watching his programs and uh you know he's kind of the voice of uh wildlife tv but um it's it's funny i've never actually worked uh with him i had a chance uh last year i had a uh a shoot that was going to go on in the in the Pyrenees and uh, yeah, they, they changed their, their dates and I was already booked for another job and that fell through. Uh, and then when the opportunity came up again, I was already booked and somebody else did it. So yeah. it's that kind of uh, uh, freelance life, I guess that uh, some of these things come off and some don't. So I'm assuming you've had a love for animals. I mean, I feel like that's how most wildlife photographers get into it. Um, what, why animals, like what about them appeals to you the most? Um, I think the, um, I mean, really I grew up in a place where I was kind of surrounded by wildlife, you know, um, I live in the Orkney Islands, so a group of small islands off the North coast of Scotland. So, um, you know, I spent a large part of my childhood outdoors, really just playing on the beach and rock pooling and, uh, certainly a lot of bird watching. So, um, so really I think just a kind of, I guess I love the outdoors first and then becoming interested in, in wildlife birds in particular. Um, and then the older I got, I would, I would start to kind of take pictures really of kind of seabirds and things like that. But it was, it was more as a means of recording them because I was more interested in the birds and the, the photography side of things. And, um, I think you probably find that a lot with camera people that are specialists in wildlife is that they're they can be interested in the wildlife aspect first and mm-hmm. then the photography aspect second. It's I don't really know any wildlife camera people that kind of got into filming and then kind of stumbled their way into uh, the wildlife side of things. It's generally a kind of it's such a competitive industry. If you really want to do it, I think you've got to have that um, that kind of love of wildlife and knowledge of, of wildlife first. And so then how did you transition from photography into like a a video cameraman? Was it just like happenstance? Someone's like, Hey, are you free? Can you hold this camera? Or was it a conscious decision? Um, No, it was very much a conscious decision. I um, I was actually working as a press photographer uh, in uh, Aberdeen in Scotland. And uh, I'd, I'd almost kind of, I went off to university when I left Orkney. I did a science degree. Um, I really, it was really the wrong course. It was uh, a lot of chemistry in it, which was uh, kind of boring and, and difficult. Was the main yeah. main uh, problem for me. But um, so I, I had that interest in the kind of biology side of things. I thought, well, I can you know I can do photography afterwards if the degree doesn't. Um, work out but I, I graduated and um I just went freelance straight away as a 
photographer in Aberdeen. I uh, had very little kit. You know, I just kind of pestered people to give me little jobs and they would give me £20, you know, to do a, a job. Um, nothing very exciting. It was like a kind of free free sheet newspaper. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it made me enough money to kind of get the bus to jobs and to, yeah. and to kind of survive and then kind of build up a bit of a portfolio. Um, and then a job came up at... Um, uh, the kind of main newspaper in the in the city, which kind of um, it was based in Aberdeen, but it had kind of regional outlets throughout Scotland. So it was quite a big, quite a big uh, newspaper. So that was quite a big jump for me to kind of, you know, one minute I was doing these little jobs, and then I remember within the first week of working there, I was photographing a Radiohead gig. And, oh, nice! Uh, yeah, so I was doing some cool stuff like that. You know, a lot of music gigs, Green Day and Foo Fighters and. Um, and football, football matches or soccer for you guys, I guess. But um, so I enjoyed that for a while. But then um, my interest in wildlife kind of resurfaced, and uh, I'd always kind of had it in the back of my head that I wanted to do uh, film work. So um, got myself a, a small loan, bought a, a Canon uh, film camera. It was still tape uh, in those days, and <laughs> um, just set about practicing and. Um, yeah, just filmed as much as I could in my spare time. But it was still quite a, quite a leap to to go freelance again after being you know kind of employed for for ten years and having that kind of uh, regular regular income. Yeah, uh, so it's kind of poking around on your website a little bit, and I mean, it seems obvious. It just never really occurred to me, but um, obviously, you travel a lot when you shoot. Uh, and it's not always like, you know, you're not going to, you know, destination, uh, I'm sorry, uh, vacation destinations. You're going kind of going out in the jungle and weird places. Yeah. Um, was that part of the plan or were you kind of like surprised at some of the places you were sent? Um, I think, I think probably most camera people like that kind of, idea that it's a bit uh kind of roughy tufty kind of thing you know you, you don't mind kind of uh living in a tent for a month at a time that kind of thing but in my experience it's not it's not quite as uh it's going to say glamorous it's, gen- it's generally not glamorous but you'd probably be surprised how many times you go out in a location and you stay in a nice hotel yeah you know you're not um I don't mind sleeping in a tent or, or roughing it, and you know that kind of out, outdoors person kind of um, thing. I, I really enjoy that. But actually, if you've if you've spent forty hours, you know, sitting cramped waiting for an animal to appear and you're freezing cold, and actually, it's it's great to get back to a hotel and have a shower and have a proper yeah. meal and and kind of start again. I mean, it's not always depending on the location. It's that's obviously not always possible, but. Um, yeah, some of some of the locations are definitely, um, you know, I had a shoot in uh, Tibet two years ago, and it was it was very much like that. You know, the first part of the shoot, I stayed in a really luxurious hotel for two weeks, and then the next location uh, was very remote, and we basically stayed in a ship's container with a wood burner for six weeks. Oh, you know, with uh, with a long drop toilet and you know, kind of basic food. So it does kind of swing from one, one extreme uh, to the other sometimes. Well, at least you get the cushy hotel sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I was just thinking like you're talking about setting up 14 hours waiting, waiting for an animal. Now, like when they make a standard movie, you know, a little storyboard and be like, I want this shot. I want that shot. Do you kind of have those same storyboards and then you have to try and get, that particular shot of the animal and like how do you I mean obviously you you can't like encourage do you encourage the animal at all like you know, with I don't know snake treats or whatever you would <laughs> use to encourage um, whatever animal yeah it's a good it's a good question because it's slightly controversial that you know like baiting an animal in order for you to be able to film it um, it's not a straightforward answer i guess the 
it depends on the production company. Some have more, what would you say, stringent uh, codes to work by. Yeah. Um, so the BBC, for example, you would, you would never bait an animal to get a get a shot, you know, because they're uh, accountable to uh, basically the UK public. So uh, yeah, you know, they have very high standards that they have to adhere to. So, but in terms of the the storyboarding, again, it very much depends on the on the shoot. You know, I do everything from kind of uh, we have a strand here in the UK called Springwatch. Mm-hmm. which is a kind of live format program that has inserts from things that I've filmed previously. So um, they generally have like a kind of main base in one part of the UK, Wales or Scotland or whatever, with about four presenters all doing different different things. So on a show like that, they may ask you to get a shot of a certain species. You just have to go out and try and find it and get what you can get. Um, whereas... I did a, a shoot for um, it was a streaming, uh, an online streaming company where I was in Sri Lanka for for fourteen weeks. In which case, you got you know absolutely massive amount of time right. for a for a while. I shoot forty weeks; it's a it's a long one, um, where you really can storyboard and try and almost kind of shoot to your uh, narrative. Whereas a lot of the time, in wildlife, you know. You could know an area really well or an animal. I think you might put its behavior and obviously it does something completely different. So um, I'd say kind of 50% of the time you're almost kind of working around the behavior that you see in front of you. Uh, and the rest of the time you're really trying to get specific uh, shots. So um, that can be tough actually if you're kind of too scripted. Um, but I think, I think most wildlife camera people uh, if it wasn't in the script, they'd just film it anyway because you, you're never quite sure. Right. You know, Better to have it and not they, need it kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it's often the shots in the edit that you think, oh, that's, you know, that wasn't quite right. It was, you know, I could have done that shot better or whatever, but actually it might make a useful link in the, the edit or something like that. So it's, it's always worth just filming it, I think. Have you ever been, you know, hired to film a particular animal that just never showed up? Like, is there one that has eluded you? Um, not really. No? <laughs> I, think been, I think I've been quite quite lucky. Uh, I did film a... Um, I mean, the, actually, the, the shoot in Tibet was tough because, you know, we were up in the Tibetan plateau. And um, as beautiful as it, as it is, it's also pretty bleak. Yeah, and um, you know the animals there, unless they're really close to the the hide or you're you're blind, um, can look really small in the in the landscape. So actually, sometimes it's not so much of an issue of finding the animals; it's just getting close enough to to film them to make a kind of workable sequence from. So, um, you know, we use these big telephoto lenses. But even with those, you've, you've still got to be pretty close to an animal, animal to be able to to make a sequence that's going to work. You know, if you are often a problem, if you can't get close enough to the animal, it's that you're, you're shooting on the long end of your lens the whole time. Mm-hmm. But if you're doing that, you don't have anywhere else to go in terms of uh, frame size. Oh, so, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and it kind of shows when you look back at your, your rushes, oh, you know, God, I wish I'd really... I could really do with like a close-up shot of the hoof going through the dark or right. uh, something like that that would uh, make it easier to cut. So uh, generally finding an animal isn't so much of a problem, partly because of the reason you'd said before, you know, there's generally a researcher that's put a lot of work into finding out about the behavior of the animal or a scientist that's working with an animal that can get you access or get you closer. Um, so it's very rare that you would just kind of go in blind uh, to an area and try and find an animal kind of cold like that. Have you ever, in trying to get that shot, gotten so close that, like, in retrospect, you're like, oh, I might have been in danger? Because, I mean, no. they're not all happy to see you, I would assume. No, I think the 
I mean, there's been a few times where, again, funnily enough, in Tibet with a with a wolf, um, we're trying to film these um, amazing looking uh, wolves, and um, again, they would, they definitely knew that we were there, mm-hmm. and would kind of keep a, a a certain distance, I guess, maybe seventy meters. Um, which is fine for showing the animal in its environment, but nowhere near close enough to be able to kind of film it properly. So, um, yeah, I was waiting in the hide for these antelope to to come along, and uh, I heard a kind of garbled message over the, the radio because we had this support car with a, a guide in it. And uh, so I looked up and I saw this this wolf on the horizon. And uh, we'd seen him a couple of days before. He was kind of not really like the other wolves. He almost uh, his coat almost looked a bit like a like a sheep actually. Okay. Um, wolf in sheep's clothing, I guess. But it was um, yeah. he was he was more length, so he looked really shaggy and uh, this big uh, furry coat on him. And uh, yeah, he he started walking towards the hide, and then he started trotting towards the hide, and I'm you know, trying to film him and keep him in focus, and I could feel myself shaking a bit. Yeah, and, uh, you know it's like 500 years since we've had wolves in Scotland, and uh, <laughs> so just kept coming closer and closer. And eventually, he was about six meters in front of the hide, and he was looking. You know, I could see him shifting his head from side to side, kind of looking in the windows. And uh, I honestly just kind of, I really wasn't frightened, but it was just such an amazing moment that actually this this animal knew something was kind of odd in its environment and had come to check it out and but was quite calm about it too there was no it was just curiosity in its part i think yeah uh, so in, so initially that definitely got my heart racing now we really close to i mean i'm not a, a animal expert but you always hear that you don't want to run because it would like is that a true thing because that engages their instinct to chase is that because, you know, us, you know, Joe Schmo, that's what we hear is like, don't run because it'll chase you. Yeah, I think that's probably true for some animals. Yeah. Um, I mean, I suspect it's probably true with bears. You'll have experience of that in uh, American uh, the states and Canada. But um, I think it's more of the kind of unpredictable. I mean, that, that wolf, as far as I could tell, was calm, you know, and, didn't show signs of any signs of aggression, but um, a lot of the time you're filming from vehicles anyway, so it would be unusual to get uh, attacked. I don't know anybody that's been uh, attacked while filming from a vehicle, but um, you, filming... you mentioned a uh, hide. Is that just kind of like some mm. sort of you know, like hunters would use them to kind of camouflage themselves, that kind of thing? Yeah. So yeah, I think you just call them blinds over there. Um, a lot of the time. It's a, it is actually hunters' blinds that we use as camouflage hides for, for filming. So um, they're a bit tricky because they're designed to shoot out of rather than film out of. So yeah. um, you've got all these windows that are kind of weird angles and not very good for panning a big lens in. But um, yeah, some are more luxurious than, than others, that's for sure. Um, and over the course of your, your career, has there been like like one animal that you kind of maybe took for granted or didn't think much about. And after filming it, you're like, wow, that's really an amazing, you know, animal creature. Yeah. I think, um, I found the family of hyena in uh, Zambia. And, uh, I think kind of popular culture has a lot to do with how we, how we view certain animals, you know, uh, certainly the original Lion King. Oh yeah. Hyenas were, were kind of, the bad guys uh, yeah bad guys and uh you know there was a particularly kind of stupid looking one that was, oh right 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 yeah um so i think we have kind of preconceived ideas for certain animals so it would tend to be things like well, wolves particularly um hyena but i think you know i filmed those hyena over the course of maybe six or seven weeks yeah going to the den every day um, and really seeing like, it sounds strange because they, they do disembowel 
uh, their prey is just eating, literally eating them alive. Yeah. But when you see them with their with their young, you know, they're very tender and caring. Uh, lots of um, kind of grooming and snuggling, and just kind of really kind of tender, intimate uh, kind of behaviour. And I think you know that's that's often overlooked. I think sometimes. So um, yeah, I came away from from Zambia with a much greater appreciation for uh, for hyenas. Nice. Um, so over here, there's a huge contention between, um, people who are interested in helping the environment and climate change deniers is, do you see that all over the world? Is that just us stupid Americans? And have you seen significant change in your career in either wildlife populations or, or, you know, just the general effect of humans on the environment. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of big questions in that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for the climate change aspect, I think there are deniers everywhere. Oh, I know it's not just us. That makes me feel a little bit just, better. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's so difficult because it's, uh, you know, we, we kind of filter everything through social media mm-hmm. now. So I think it's really important. Um, and I think this is where kind of wildlife films play a role, but also um, something that I think a lot of people just aren't willing to do is do the research yourself. You know, don't just read the headline. Yeah. Which, which very much happens on social media. You know, you you'll see something and you'll be outraged within five seconds, and then you'll you'll post something. And this happened uh, locally yesterday on, on Facebook. A friend of mine uh, replied to to somebody who had sent him an article. Uh, it was actually uh, it was to do with um, what's going on in America just now, actually with George Floyd and um, mm-hmm. the guy himself was in in Australia and. Uh, he sent an article, uh, or he posted an article, and my friend said, uh, none of this backs up your argument. Have you actually read the article? And he had to admit that he hadn't read it. Yeah. And I think it's a bit like that with uh, climate change or any kind of environmental problem where you know, you've got to read a bit more and you've got to find out more about it, find evidence and there's absolutely tons of research out there you know there's no excuse for well as far as i can see there's absolutely no excuse for being a climate denier yeah. um, and the or, thing that i find a lot of people do is they read the headline and then they put their own spin on it like i was having a conversation mm-hmm. recently specifically about you know the, the protests and the riots here um and I live just south of Boston. There was a big one in Boston, lots of damage. And, um, you know, there's this thing going around where it's, you know, people are implying that there's some sort of traveling band of miscreants that go from one town to another town to another town that are doing all the damage. And so the article basically said um, that a, a good portion of the arrests made were from people out of town. And so this person's all up in arms. They're like, oh, you know, see, it is this traveling band. I'm like, well, that just says they don't live in Boston. You know, yeah. I mean, if I went there and got arrested, I'd be technically an out-of-towner getting arrested. You know, it, it's yeah. stop. And you have to just read exactly what it says and stop trying to put your implications on it. Yeah, I often think that uh, as great as some of the things that social media provides us with, it, it's, it's often not a place for a nuanced argument. No, you know, not at all. No. <laughs> but I do feel like every once in a while, we all do get duped into that argument where like after like a good yeah. hour, you're like, why am I even talking to this person? Yeah. It's uh, it is hard not to get sucked in sometimes, but yeah. Uh, yeah. But I think from, in terms of seeing kind of changes in climate or animal populations, um, Again, that can be quite subtle sometimes where, uh, you know, certainly here we have, um, you can start to see changes in the south of England where 
uh, where animals that were once kind of at the northern range of their limit are now breeding there. So, you know, animals that eat often, or birds particularly, uh, insects, where, you know, 10 years ago they might have stopped breeding in the north of France or something like that. And now, as it gets warmer, they have to go that little bit further north to, mm-hmm. to find the cooler conditions. So so we're seeing this kind of almost a, a kind of encroachment from the south of animals and species that, you know, are adapting to climate change by changing their their range, really. Um, that's okay up until a point, you know, until actually there's nowhere further north to go. So, right, right. So animals that you find in Scotland that, um, you know, live in the mountains, we would maybe until about 10 years ago still have had some snow cover right through the year. Um, so the animals that are specifically adapted to living in those cold conditions, you know, if it's, we certainly have much milder winters now, wet or warmer winters. Um, they just don't have that snow cover. So, you know, animals like mountain hare that turn white in winter, yeah. are suddenly much more visible on a brown mountain than a white one. So they're much more easily predated, things like that. It's just, um, so you notice those kind of changes rather than kind of big kind of wholesale uh, kind of spectacles, if you like. So we as human beings tend to want to save cute animals. You know, pandas, dolphins, <laughs> uh, is there an animal that you've filmed that you're kind of, well, we, we kind of talked about the, the hyenas, but is, has there been like, I don't want to say overrated, but is there an, an, an animal like, I feel like pandas are kind of, they're super cute, but they're kind of dull. Don't they just kind of sit and lay around? I mean, it, it, what animal should, the, the well, animal should pandas? not be saved. <laughs> yeah. Well, then not, not be saved, but it's just like, you know, are there any that you're just like, oh, got to do another dolphin documentary? Like, is do you get tired of kind of like doing the same kind of animal? Um, yeah, I mean, there is there is one animal that I uh, I probably won't be very popular for saying it because it is super cute, but um, red squirrels, yeah, uh, are a kind of how would you describe it? It's it's, it's one of those species that actually we think of as being rare in the UK, but actually, you know, it's quite widespread on a UK level. So, sorry, on a, a global level. So, um, you know, it was, initially it was a, a species that was, it was the only species of squirrel here. And then somebody introduced your squirrels, the grey gray squirrels, who yeah. out, out-competed a lot of the red ones and uh, gave them a, uh, nasty disease, things like that. So, um, so they are very much seen as a kind of iconic Scottish animal. But um, I don't know. I just don't like. I just don't like filming them. Gee, I've so, filmed them quite a bit. It's so funny. Like even here, like people either are like, "Oh my god, squirrels are so cute," or they're like, "Ugh, they're just rats <laughs> with better PR." <clears throat> yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they are an interesting species. It's just. I think part of it is they're quite difficult. They move really fast uh, yeah. or move really quickly. Sorry. Uh, so I think generally, if you've if you've had a shoot where the thing you've tried to film it hasn't gone that well, that might kind of skew your uh, <laughs> skew your view of the animal. They're cute, but they're assholes. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there is there something on your like bucket list that you're like, oh, I'd really like to to film, you know, penguins or, or you know. Yeah, I'd like. Uh, I haven't been to the Arctic, or I haven't been to any of the polar regions, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I would. I'd love to work on something that gave me the opportunity to to film walrus or musk ox or um, polar bears. Something like that would be uh, pretty awesome, I think. And with um, you know, the current COVID issues, are you able to travel and work or are you kind of just on hiatus now? Or um, It's a kind of complicated picture, but mostly I, I can't travel. Um, so I had, 
I were you in the middle of shooting or? Um, no, like I had a job. Uh, it's funny in Scotland. It was that spring watch, although they went out of the winter watch. Um, where I kind of started to hear about COVID and um, I was keeping an eye on it because I had a shoot in China coming yeah. up um, in, I think it was going to be April time. So, um, but one of the cameramen that I was sharing a, a house with on the shoot, he also had a shoot in China and his was cancelled uh, as we were uh, working on this other project. So um, I just thought, oh, it's, it's a matter of time before my shoot in China falls by the way as well, uh, which, it, which it did. And uh, I thought, well, that's, you know, maybe I can do it later in the year. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had a job in Africa lined up. Um, and then it was about a month later, really, that we got to a stage where everybody just said, oh, that's, you know, everybody's locked down. I mean, I had a, a friend who actually flew to Chile, had like one day's work, and then all the rules changed and she just came straight back to the UK. Yeah. So, um, and funnily enough, there was potentially a shoot in, in the States as well. And obviously that's just not happening. Oh so, yeah. You don't, you don't want to come here right now. <laughs> <no>. <laughs> um, so I can, I can do a limited amount of work locally. Yeah. Um, but even that's tricky because the, it's kind of unique uh, circumstances for, for each area. You know? So it's, slightly more unusual that um on a group of islands. So even within the group of islands, you know, we have a ferry service to all the different islands that have like, uh, they might have 500 people living on them, that kind of thing. Those small islands don't want people coming from even the main island. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have uh, Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket, like just right off the coast uh-huh. here. And they're kind of a little ahead of the curve, like with getting to reopen and stuff, because they're like, mm-hmm. well, we, you, you guys just stay on the mainland and keep yeah. your germs to yourself. And, and yeah. uh, so they're, they're doing a little better than the rest of us. Yeah. So we don't have, I think we've had, uh, in the population where I live, it's, it's only 20,000 people, but um, I think there's been eight, eight confirmed cases and two, two deaths. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it is, it is here. Um, and we have had a slight kind of easing and restrictions just this week, actually, where you can, before you could walk your dog, but you couldn't drive somewhere to take your dog for a walk. You had to. Right. Right. Just around your neighborhood uh, or whatever. Yeah. But now you can drive five miles to a location. Um, and you know, you can, I went snorkeling for the first time this year, you know, so suddenly you're allowed to to do some uh, activities that you couldn't do last week. So I think it's probably a good thing for people's mental health that we've suddenly kind of gotten to get a little bit of a, uh, yeah. an easing. So now when you normally travel, I mean, there was, you know, the original SARS and MERS and a lot of these are animal born and, to, I mean, I don't know if he's traveled to those countries specifically, but is, you know, contagions and diseases a constant thing that you have to be concerned about? No, especially, I mean, the, um, you know, you just get all your inoculations. Um, I mean, really getting bitten by mosquitoes is probably a harder thing to avoid than, uh, you know, say, I've got an inoculation for Japanese encephalitis, that kind of thing. So, you know, you're very much aware of what's, uh, what you're likely to get. Um, so, you know, you, you get your inoculation or shots just kind of up to date most of the time. But I think, um, yeah, you certainly have to be wary about uh, where you eat sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, generally we're, we're pretty well catered for with other team members kind of taking care of that kind of thing. Nice. Um, so being a wildlife photographer and, you know, for a love of animals, does that carry over? Do you have like a small zoo? You mentioned a dog. I, so I assume you have a dog, but are you one of those people who have like, oh, I have a dog and a parrot and a cat and a gerbil and a snake and like. No, I mean, we only, we only got a dog, uh, 
She's 10 months old now, so... Oh, nice, that's a puppy. Yeah, so uh, she's a fox red Labrador. Um, nice. Yeah, really beautiful uh, girl dog, Lyra. So, uh, no, we don't have... Um, we don't have a menagerie. It's kind of my sister lives on a farm, so she's she's got all the animals you could ever uh, hope to want if you were if you were really that excited by uh, <laughs> chickens and goats and horses yeah. and things. But um, no, I'm happy to to see the animals out in the wild. But it, it is lovely having a having a dog. Uh, so earlier you were talking about how you went out and got a camera and kind of started practicing um, filming. So if, you know, if you were giving advice to a young person who wanted to get into um, wildlife filming and photography, should they go to the zoo? Should they start with trying to get pictures of the squirrels in their neighborhood? Like what, what would you recommend them kind of starting to do? Um, I think it's interesting. I had a, I got a message from somebody recently. Um, you know, I get periodically, I'll get letters, people asking that exact thing, you know, I want to be involved in the wildlife filming industry. This is my show reel. I take a look and, um, you know, generally I try and, uh, certainly reply to everybody that gets in touch because I was afforded the same courtesy by people when I when I did it so um, I was surprised sometimes how often people put footage from zoos in yeah um, I just I wouldn't do that I feel like that's from cheating a, a little bit it's, it's not it's, you know where it's going to be it's only got so much room to move around yeah I mean I, I would be far more interested in seeing a two minute film about the snails in somebody's garden than I would some nicely lit shots of a zebra in a, in a zoo by far, because it's, you know, you, you want to see that somebody's really thinking about um, the kind of filming process, uh, you know, so have a, a kind of range of shots. But I think if you're just starting out from absolute scratch, I would just say, go and watch as much wildlife as you can. That can be the squirrels in your park. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you don't need to go to Africa and watch leopards to, to learn about wildlife. It's, it's actually much better if you can find your local patch pond or beach, or if you've got a stream that runs through your town, like that, it'll definitely have wildlife, you know, so you could document it over the course of a year. You know, you could do like dragonfly hatching or something and then, you know, kind of follow animals through the winter um so i think it's much better when you're starting off to to work locally because you're probably not gonna have that much cash unless you're wealthy i know a few individuals that have you know been able to buy a rent straight off because their dad bought it for them that kind of thing but it's (laughs) not that common yeah Um, so and you know getting your work seen it's kind of a double-edged sword because it's it's much easier than when i started you know i was I was posting out DVDs to people Mm -hmm. saying, can you watch this? Uh, You know, writing letters. Dropbox a file, yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, get your own uh, channel on Vimeo or YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, And don't be afraid to to show people um, and get feedback. Um, Once you've kind of been in it a little bit, I think a, a really useful thing to do, and I still do this, as much as I can is to find a good editor yeah, and let an editor critique your work because they'll know straight away, well, this would be so much easier if you had given me a nice wide shot or, or a real close up shot, something like that. So I think working with an editor is a, an excellent way to kind of uh, improve your filmmaking skills. Yeah. It's funny. Like I, I never, you know, scheduling this, um, interview. I never really thought about it, but I, I watch a YouTube channel. It, it, he's literally starting from his living room. He's he's filming. Uh, they're pretty elaborate, but they're ant farms, you know. And mm-hmm. he's got um, 
fire ants and I think his channel's called Ants Canada and he you know he'll film them building their nest and he does a really good job of kind of giving each episode like a theme and you know he opens it with a question and and kind of closes it with the answer and so he does a really nice job and it, it's just one guy in his house so it's I suppose you can do it on any level you can yeah I think um and I was, I was the same when I started, you know, you just want to get straight in there and work on Frozen Planet straight away. Yeah. yeah. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's, um, unless you're, you're very lucky. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think if you can, I remember when I started thinking, well, what, what could I realistically offer a producer if an opportunity came up and, I was able to do some filming. So, you know, I, once I bought that camera, I lived near a, a seabird colony. Mm-hmm. And uh, at that time, actually, climate change was starting to, to make an impact on seabird numbers. Um, and then in the course of filming that, I discovered that one bird in particular suffered from uh, plastic ingestion. So we yeah. pick up bits of plastic off the surface of the ocean thinking it was food. So I made a film about that um, and I narrated, uh, researched, edited, filmed. It was 40 minutes long and I went into a competition in the States, International Wildlife Film Festival. And I won an award for that. I came across, bumped into a BBC producer who was making a natural world film for the BBC uh, in Scotland. And he said, right, come and work for me for two weeks without pay. Uh, so I turned up, there was a kit room, which was really intimidating. It was kind of top end uh, kit. I didn't yeah. even know how to put the tripod head together. <laughs> uh, and he, he said, right, go and get me some shots. It's going to make it into the, into the final program. And uh, so I went away and did that. And I, I came back and we watched it on the monitor. And he says, oh, how, how do you think he did? I said, oh, yeah, pretty, pretty good, I think. And uh, he, he tore my shots to shreds. And uh, he always referred to this this cameraman that um, did a famous sequence of Snow Leopard. Uh, I think it was Planet Earth, where it chases the uh, sheep or antelope or whatever it was down the, the face of this very uh, steep cliff. And he said, well, that would, that would be his, uh, if that's your close-up shot, that would be his medium shot. So... You know, you've got to get closer. Um, he says, you know, if you haven't improved in about three days, this just isn't going to work. You know, so like massive pressure. Right. You've been given this, you've been given this great opportunity. And uh, I just thought I'd completely blown it. And uh, I remember standing out in the middle of a, a bog in the middle of nowhere by myself with this massive camera and tripod. And uh, I just thought, oh, I've just cocked this whole thing up. I I don't know what I'm doing. So um, I phoned, it was a little bit like a light bulb, but I I saw the name of the hire company on the lens Mm -hmm. and uh, I just phoned them up and I said, look, I explained the situation. I said, uh, I find it really difficult to get this thing steady. You know, can you give me any tips? And God, he was so nice to me. He just said, oh, you know, there's guys that have been using that lens for like 20 years they still find it difficult. It's not easy. You know, just take a deep breath, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, and he had some kind of practical advice. So I uh, followed that and then got some shots and uh, kind of held my breath as a producer. I'm going to look back at them again. And he said, yeah, that's, that's much better. So. Um, Do you think part of that of- was him testing to see if you were serious? <laughs> Kind of like, yeah, oh, very, if I give this guy a hard time on the first day. If he shows up the second day, at least know he's committed. Yeah, very much. I mean, he he said, uh, we're out filming. It was, it's like all these things that kind of happen, not through luck. I think he, I think you do make your own luck. But, um, you know, he, he sat there when we were filming something and he said, do you know how many letters I have in my top drawer from people that want to want to do this. And he said, you know, and you just you just happened to meet me in that was Missoula in Montana. Um you know, so you've got this opportunity. Um 
and it is kind of true. I mean, it's so super competitive. I can't begin to tell you, but um, yeah, I think you you have to be completely dedicated to it um, and kind of accept. I think sometimes that it's just not going to go your way. Sometimes mm-hmm. you, know, you can't. Just kind of what we were speaking about before. You know, you can't tell the animals what to what to do. But I think you almost have to kind of find a bit of a niche for yourself as well. The kit's becoming so specialised now. You know, you've got guys that specialise entirely in using like shot over cameras. And, um, there's always been a degree of of that with people doing macro work, and um, you know, I do a lot of uh, bird kind of behaviour. So you kind of get known for for different things. That's awesome. Uh, where can our listeners go online to? check out your work or see what you're working on? Um, I guess it's probably easiest to, to follow on social media. It's, it's, it's become really tricky. Uh, these last, I'd say actually since Netflix have appeared on the scene, yeah, that, that um, everything now is under uh, non-disclosure articles. Oh, uh, okay which one makes it really difficult to get any footage to show people uh, you work from your showreel. Right. Um, So, you know, the, that shoot in Tibet, that's only just coming out this year, but I filmed that two years ago, you know, so I can't share any of the So you can't talk about it. Yeah. You know, I can speak up on it about it on a kind of general level, but generally anything that's uh, to do with Netflix or Apple TV or, and it's it's all under uh, NDAs, which is a real pain in the ass, really. But um, and and because a lot of the stuff I do is for British TV, yeah, you can't access a lot of it, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, it, it takes some yes. work, but usually you can. Um, we you know we can find it. Mm, yeah. say fifty to sixty percent of the time. <laughs> The trick is knowing about it to go look for it. That I think that's the hardest thing. Yeah, I guess it's um, you get these kind of uh, certainly in the UK anyway these real peaks and troughs of uh, kind of wildlife TV where it's you know you're almost kind of inundated with two months worth of uh, stuff the BBC have been working on and then it kind of calms down again and then four or five months later you get the same again. So it's you end up being quite choosy, I think, about what you end up uh, what you end up watching. Cool, man. Like I said, this is a real pleasure. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, and now, no, I'm thank you. Looking Thanks out for, for your your name when I'm watching these documentaries because I got to admit, I don't usually watch the credits. <laughs> um, but no, it's uh, it's very cool work, and uh, it's not someone that we. It's not our standard guests. So it's yeah. cool just to hear something, you know, that different and how you kind of, you know, built it up from, you know, basically your backyard, you know, starting with those animals, uh, with the birds and that's yeah, really neat. Yeah. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having me. No problem. Um, so that's, that wraps up the show. Uh, thanks to our listeners for listening and, uh, you know, best of luck on, on getting back out on the road and heading off. To yeah. Thanks. You too. Whatever your next project may be. Thanks. Take care. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Uh, you can find us on all social medias at inebriart, except for Instagram, we're at inebriart6. You can email us with your questions, complaints, and whatnot at inebriart at yahoo.com. And if you're looking for more podcasts, you can check out the other podcasts on our network, uh, Retro Redoctopus, uh, America's Hometown Horror, and, of course, Bar Talk, Old Colony, and inebriart podcast, the original Um, So check those out and subscribe and comment so we can reach more people. And thanks for listening.